Hi, and welcome to my Hidden History channel, where I'm exploring some of the less well-known facts about World War II. In this video, I'm going to look at the living conditions inside Stalin's Gulag. This was a collection of 30,000 forced labour camps in Siberia, a vast and desolate landscape covering 5 million square miles. And the reason Siberia is so desolate is because of the lack of infrastructure. Roads and railways are very difficult to construct because of the harsh climate. A fifth of Siberia lies within the Arctic Circle, where temperatures can fall to minus 60 degrees. It's one of the coldest places on the planet. And in addition to that, 65% of Siberia is covered in permafrost. This is a mixture of earth and ice that thaws into mud and swamps during the short summer months. And this makes the uh, foundation unstable for construction of roads and railways. Stalin used the slave labour of millions of prisoners in an effort to colonise this land to extract its natural resources and to complete massive infrastructure projects necessary to turn the Soviet Union into a modern industrial economy. Not much remains of the original Gulag camps today. Built from wood, most have rotted away and disappeared. If you were unfortunate enough to end up in one of these camps, the future was very bleak indeed. Prisoners were forced to work outdoors in the extreme cold without suitable clothing, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, felling trees, mining coal, and undertaking mammoth construction projects with only the most basic hand tools. In these barren regions, there were no crops, and transport of food was limited by the lack of infrastructure. The poultry food rations ensured that prisoners would die of starvation, assuming they didn't die of hypothermia or disease first. Typically, the camps had multiple perimeter fences patrolled with guard dogs. Even if prisoners managed to escape, there was nowhere for them to go. They were likely to freeze to death, starve, or be eaten by wolves or bears. The food rations given to the prisoners was grossly inadequate for their caloric expenditure, and it was the same for every meal – bread, gruel, and watery soup. Every third day or so they might get a little meat or fish. There were only two meals a day breakfast and dinner, and the amount of food was rationed according to whether a prisoner had completed his daily work quota. The amount of food also depended on the type of labour and was higher for people working on Stalin's showcase projects. But even if a prisoner achieved his quota, the number of calories still amounted to a starvation diet and people performing this hard labour simply could not survive on it. If a prisoner failed to meet his quota, he got less food, meaning he became weaker and weaker and less able to meet his quota on subsequent days. And in this punitive cycle, the weaker prisoners were killed off in a matter of months. They were called goners. So I don't think the gulag was really about forced labour because if these people's rations had been more adequate, they would have been able to achieve far greater productivity. Rather, I think of them as extermination camps. Starvation was even more severe when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. In that year alone, a quarter of the Gulag's entire population was wiped out. Discipline in the camps was maintained by the camp guards, who are pictured here on the left. 
They meted out cruel punishments for not working hard enough, severe beatings and confinement to unheated cells without food where prisoners could freeze to death. In the thaw of the summer months, swamps became infested with mosquitoes and guards would strip prisoners naked and leave them there to be bitten to death by bugs. But the people who ruled the worst camps were themselves prisoners. These were hardened criminals, murderers, rapists and thieves. And the gang members were instantly recognisable by their fearsome body tattoos. A tattoo of a cat, like the one below me, represented a thief, and a skull represented a murderer. The gang bosses dictated which prisoners were assigned to the hardest outdoor labour, effectively handing out their death sentence. Of course, they also assigned themselves to the easiest jobs at the camps, such as the hospital and the kitchen, where they stayed indoors with access to extra food. So to survive in such camps, prisoners did the bidding of the gangs with sexual favours, stealing and worse, so as to get lighter duties and extra food. These thugs were extremely violent, murdering other prisoners by electrocution, beheading, stabbing and whatever else they felt like doing. The living quarters were primitive and overcrowded breeding grounds for disease. People slept fully dressed on wooden planks without mattresses or bedding. There was nowhere to store valuable belongings securely, so anything, including warm clothes and boots, could be stolen unless you were wearing it. There was nowhere to dry wet clothes soaked through from working in the snow. Most prisoners didn't have a change of clothing and their filthy clothes became infested with body lice. Although the camps nominally had a bathhouse and a de-lousing station, they were clearly ineffective since body lice were rampant throughout the camps. There were two ways to kill body lice, either using steam or carbolic soap. In these freezing temperatures, I think it's unlikely that the delousing stations ever got hot enough to kill the lice, and there was a chronic shortage of soap throughout the Soviet Union. These body lice were able to transmit typhus, a deadly bacterial infection with a 40% mortality rate. And of course the death rate would be much higher in people already weakened by starvation. Typhus epidemics took millions of lives in the Soviet Union during the war. Every day, dead bodies were carried out of the barracks and piled up like firewood before being dumped in mass graves. The barracks would have emptied altogether if it weren't for the arrival of new prisoners to replace them. Women formed less than 15% of the population of the Gulag, but those unfortunate enough to end up there were expected to perform exactly the same hard labour as the men, breaking rocks, mining coal, felling timber. They had the same work quotas and the same rations. These women were extremely vulnerable to mistreatment in the camps. At the time of their deportation, they would most likely have been separated from their husbands and so they had no male protection in the camps. Rape by prison guards and gangs was commonplace. Gang bosses owned several women and reportedly had a special predilection for women from Poland and other Eastern European countries. Some women took gulag husbands guards or other prisoners for personal protection, using their sexual favours to get extra food and preferential work. Inevitably, this resulted in pregnancies, which were both wanted and unwanted. 
Some women wanted to become pregnant because this would give them leave from their hard labour. They saw pregnancy as a matter of their own survival. Now, theoretically, they were entitled to 35 days off work before the birth and 28 days after the birth. But in some camps, guards didn't want to lose productivity and they forced these women to have abortions. Other women performed their own abortions. Of course, none of these terminations were conducted using appropriate medical care and they were dangerous. After pregnancies that proceeded to term, women were often sent back to work almost immediately. The babies were placed in nurseries where their mothers were able to visit only at specified times to breastfeed them. When they were no longer breastfeeding, the infants were transferred to orphanages and the women never saw them again. Conditions in the orphanages were truly awful. Mortality was so high they were nicknamed angel factories. The children wore the same disgusting underwear for months because they had no change of clothes. They were bathed twice a month but this was ineffective because there was no soap. Their clothes and bedding were teeming with body lice. Because of the neglect, four-year-old children were unable to speak. Infants spent the entire day left lying in their cots. What became of them, if any of them survived, no one knows. The Gulag isn't just about Stalin. Political repression still pervades Russia today. There are about 550 political prisoners in Russia. Their crime opposition to Vladimir Putin. Prisoners in Russian jails are subjected to brutal beatings and rape by their guards. Putin has been accused of developing a rulag, Russia's new version of Stalin's penal system. So let's not forget the people who are still suffering in Russia's jails right now. Next time, I'll be looking at the types of forced labour performed by the Gulag prisoners. I hope you learned something new from this video, and thank you for watching. Please give me a like below and subscribe to my channel so you can check out my other videos.